Okay, good morning, everyone, uh, and good afternoon for those of you on the East Coast. Uh, this is Richard Eidlin with Business for America. Thanks for joining us this morning for our election funding briefing to support safe and accessible elections in 2020. And uh, we've pulled together a great panel of business leaders uh, this morning, plus our colleague from the Brennan Center, and I'll introduce everyone here in a moment. But the purpose of this call is to give all of you an update on what is happening in Congress about the uh, proposed funding for election security. And as I think a lot of you know, Business for America as a nonpartisan national uh, organization has been working uh, to encourage Congress to provide uh, projected $3.6 billion for election security. And, um, and that money would go to the states to enable them to run safe and secure and credible elections. So the debate in Congress is coming to a close as the discussion around the next stimulus package um, heats up and the election funding monies would be part of that uh, stimulus package. So today we wanted to, um, number one, get an update as to what's happening in Congress, two, tell you what we've been doing uh, in terms of reaching out to a number of Senate offices, and then three, hear from a number of our colleagues who've been working with us on this campaign. So uh, briefly, let me just introduce uh, folks. Um, Liz Howard is with the Brennan Center, and Liz will be giving us an update on uh, their work in Congress, and also an, an, an overview of some of the ins and outs and gory details of what's happening and what we might look for over the next week in terms of funding. Uh, we also have Jonathan Perry from Lime Scooters. Um, Jen Swain is with Burton Snowboards and uh, Burton Snowboards, as you know, is a national company um, headquartered uh, in Vermont. Uh, Kirby Bumpus is with uh, Sweet Green and Sweet Green, for those of you who may not know, is uh, uh, healthy food uh, purveyor with about 100, 110 stores in eight or nine states across the country. And finally, uh, Kelly Velakis Hanks is the CEO of Ecos, which is a consumer products company. And you probably have seen their products in Whole Foods and natural grocers and lots of other stores uh, across the country. And finally, we have uh, Business for America CEO, Sarah Bonk, or as she uh, goes by the name of Bonk. And she's going to give us some details of, uh, of our work and our campaign efforts. Um, so just again, by way of quick uh, background, uh, Business for America uh, submitted a letter to the Senate Rules Committee last week that included the signatures of over 200 companies that had signed on to a letter calling on Congress to provide funding for these elections uh, in, in 2020. And I think as you all have probably been reading, in part because of the COVID crisis, election officials across the country have identified a need for additional uh, supplies, PPE, equipment, mail processing equipment, plus poll workers. And our concern as a business organization from the outset has been that we want to ensure that the elections are run in a safe and secure and credible way. And in doing so, that there's no excuse um, for, uh, and, for a lack of credibility and that no one can challenge the legitimacy of the outcome of the election. And obviously we've been hearing a lot uh, over the past week, including from the president, about the, uh, the apparent, the supposed weakness in our election infrastructure. We've been hearing about the postal system, not having sufficient money and resources, and uh, about the, uh, the supposed problems with voting by mail. So there are a lot of challenges that we're facing as we go into the 2020 election. And Business for America's point of view is that the business community has a lot at stake in having a safe and secure and credible election. So that's why we've been advocating as we have. Um, we've had four meetings over the past week with uh, Republican members of the Senate. Um, those include Senator Roy Blunt from Missouri, Senator Gardner, Cory Gardner from Colorado, Senator Marco Rubio's office from Florida, 
and Senator Pat Toomey from Pennsylvania. Um, and what we have found is there is interest in providing funding. Um, and at the same time, there's a concern on part of the Republican uh, caucus that the federal government does not uh, take over the elections, does not federalize the elections, does not impose a series of requirements or stringent conditions on how that money is spent. So Liz is gonna give us a bit more detail here in a moment. So without uh, further ado, let me turn it over to my colleague, Sarah Bonk, and then we'll uh, go to Liz. Great. Thank you so much, Richard, and thank you to our panelists, and thank you everybody for joining us. Uh, it was about a week ago that I found myself in a meeting with Senator Roy Blunt, and we actually did have the Senator himself, and uh, we really were able to pull together quite an interesting combination of business leaders. We were focused on bringing businesses with um, a presence in Missouri and bringing the perspective of the business community there. We had two major chambers of commerce. We had uh, quite a few prominent Missouri business leaders, some of whom were conservative, several of whom have donated to the Senator in the past, some of whom have lobbied him in the past. Uh, we had a couple of small business uh, owners, entrepreneurs who are up and coming in the business community. And we also had representatives from prominent national brands who have a large presence in Missouri. And this is the power that the business community has to be able to get the attention of the senator. Um, some of us may lament that uh, that is the situation, that it's so easy for business to get lawmakers' attention, and sometimes it's too hard for citizens to get their attention. But nonetheless, when we can, uh, when we can get their ear, we want to use that for good. And so we had that opportunity to, to pull together. And it was just lovely to hear people from across the political spectrum, all different types of businesses, coming together to say, Senator, this is important to us. And we think this is not a partisan issue. This is about having elections where we know that our employees are going to be safe and they're going to be heard and that we're going to have uh, stability and predictability in the marketplace and in our society. And it's just the right thing to do. And it was a great conversation. And just as a little anecdote, um, we had um, a, a, a CEO named Sarah Schlafly, whose last name may be familiar to you. She's Phyllis Schlafly's granddaughter and uh, a Missouri entrepreneur. And she said to the Senator, would you please let Senator McConnell know that the business community cares about this? and ask him to provide the funding. So this is the, um, the, the kind of meetings we'd like to do more of. And um, we've, we've got a couple more on the map. And obviously we're starting to see this effort around funding for safe voting taper off, but Business for America is not done. Our democracy is not uh, secure, stable, strong at this stage in time. And um, that's where we really have a unique value to offer. Business America was founded with this idea that the interest of the public and the interest of the business community are aligned on having a well-functioning representative democracy and elections that we can all really trust and where everybody who wishes to participate is able to participate. And this idea that chaotic elections and hyper-partisanship and political polarization hurt all of us, it's something we can all get behind. So while these unfortunate circumstances this year around public health crisis and the economic crisis, um, uh, we, no, none of us are enjoying being on this ride right now. We also want to take advantage of the opportunity to take action and use our influence to, to um, see if we can help democracy be stronger for having gone through this together. So know that um, your business has a voice, the business community is really starting to rally behind this idea of the health of our democracy and that we're ready to use our influence for good on this issue. Um, coming up next, you know, we're, we're going to have more to tell you about this soon, but we're doing several, uh, several things to keep the momentum going. One is we're going to be asking the business community, um, and we have several businesses that have already made a commitment, to directly support uh, provide assistance to election officials in their states and their communities. That may take the form of inviting your staff, you're inviting your workforce to uh, work the polls if they choose. It may be offering up facilities that would be appropriate, publicly available, um, accessible 
uh, facilities as polling places. And it may be providing PPE like masks or helping with um, you know, hand sanitizer and, and, and ways to keep the polling places safe. And it may be also um, providing other kinds of assistance like communications and public service announcements and um, better voter information. So we're really doing quite an operation here. We call it Operation Vote Safe. And uh, there'll be opportunity for everybody to get involved if they choose. Um, another thing we've got going on is we are convening a small working group on racial equity and voting. Again, we've got commitments from a few businesses. We're going to start that off soon. If you're interested, you can hit me up. Uh, I'm bonk, B-O-N-K, at BFA.us. We definitely invite your participation and support. Um, it's going to be both a little bit of like pragmatic politics, seeing if we want to get involved in things like um, the John Lewis Voter Voting Rights Act um, is, or other legislation that we may wish to get behind, as well as creative new ideas around how innovative businesses can engage their workforces and engage their communities and tie racial equity to voting and help um, voters uh, everywhere, especially those who have been traditionally disenfranchised, to vote more easily. So. Um, Lots more after that, but that is a little preview of what's to come, and we do hope you'll join us. And thank you to all of you for your support so far. Good, Bonk. Thank you. Good. So let's turn to Liz Howard from the Brennan Center to give us a little commentary and update on what's happening in Congress. So Liz, um, you know, yesterday, uh, uh, Mark Meadows and Secretary Mnuchin were meeting with, um, with Nancy Pelosi and Chuck Schumer trying to work out a deal. Uh, unemployment benefits expire at the end of today. There's a lot of pressure on Congress to come up with an agreement. And election funding obviously is one small part, but an important part of that overall package. So what should people know about the next 24, 48 hours here as, as the negotiations continue? Well, just to take this um, back just a step, right? As, as everyone knows, um, Congress passed the first big coronavirus stimulus package earlier this year, um, and it included 400 million for elections funding. And after that, um, the Brennan Center, uh, working with our partners, R Street and, and many others, worked with election officials across the country and election vendors across the country to come up with some estimates about the real costs facing our election officials as they work to put on safe and secure elections. Um, so our estimate is that our election officials are facing um, an additional $4 billion in unbudgeted, unplanned for expenses. Um, and there is widespread acknowledgement that the 400 million included in the first coronavirus stimulus package is simply not enough. Um, and just absolutely wanted to say thank you so much um, to Bonk and Richard and to Business for America for really bringing this um, issue to senators. Um, hearing from the businesses in their communities is so important. Um, right now, the House um, released their version of the next stimulus package, the, the HEROES Act, um, in May. It includes $3.6 billion uh, for our election officials. Um, and as Richard mentioned earlier this week, uh, the Senate released their version of the next um, coronavirus stimulus package, the HEALS Act. Unfortunately, um, the Senate's version includes no funding at all for elections. Um, which is a big problem um, and a big concern for election officials, for businesses, and for other citizens. Uh, right now, there are several important senators that are gonna uh, have a big voice in whether or not elections funding is included in the final negotiated package. So Senator Blunt, who is the chair of the Rules Committee um, that Sarah spoke about earlier with their meeting, and again, thank you so much uh, the Rules Committee has a jurisdiction over federal elections, um, and the Senate is definitely going to want to know what Senator Blunt thinks about including additional funding in this next package. Um, uh, he and uh, the ranking member of the Rules Committee, Senator Kobachar, have absolutely taken this issue very seriously and just saw them um, conduct a hearing last week uh, with election officials from across the country to hear about their plans for the November election. Um, and 
couple of things of note, including uh, Rick Stream, the Republican um, elections director for St. Louis, uh, talk about how um, election administration costs are rapidly rising due to costs associated with the pandemic, um, while government revenues are plummeting, um, which is another big concern for election officials. So uh, right now, um, we also need the support of Senator uh, McConnell, who's the leader of the Senate, and you just saw um, the uh, chair of the Kentucky State Board of Elections put out a, an op-ed calling uh, calling on Congress to provide additional funding for election officials in Kentucky and across the country. Um, a couple of other important senators are Senator Shelby, um, who is the chair of the Appropriations Committee, so he's from Alabama. Um, and you also have Senator Kennedy, who is the chair of the subcommittee um, that has jurisdiction over the elections funding. And um, you just saw Secretary of State Ardwan earlier this week uh, mentioned that additional funding in this next coronavirus stimulus package was critical for election officials. So we, we, we've seen some positive signs this past week, Senator Blunt specifically, um, perhaps right after the meeting uh, with BFA, mentioned that he was open to considering additional funding and, and you saw Senator McConnell make um, similar comments. So negotiations are underway in earnest right now between um, the Senate, the House, and the White House. Um, we expect them to finalize a deal before the Senate goes on a break, which will happen later in August. So the next two to three weeks are just absolutely gonna be critical. But again, thank you so much for, for um, everything that you're doing. Um, please know how important it is for business to engage in this fight. Um, and I'll turn it back over to Richard. Great, good Liz, thank you. Let, let me ask you just a quick follow-up question about the vote by mail issue. And you know, there, I think there's been some confusion about absentee balloting, which the president supports, but he doesn't support vote by mail. And how is that issue about vote by mail part of this funding um, package? What's the relationship? So the reality is, is that um, vote by mail is happening, whether or not partisan um, uh, operatives feel that it's appropriate or not. Americans in the primary, you have seen them um, take advantage of the opportunity to vote by mail. Uh, the majority of states already allow any voter that's eligible to vote by mail. Um, and so in Wisconsin, for instance, we saw about 70% of the voters uh, opted to vote by mail. And the reality is, is that voting by mail um, is expensive. Um, election officials have to have the staff to respond to the paper applications from voters that want to vote by mail. So they have to process that. They go through a rigorous um, procedure to ensure that the applicant is appropriately, uh, is eligible to vote. Um, and so then they have to get the right ballot um, to the voter with the with instructions, with the appropriate envelopes for them to return the ballot. Um, and then they have to, right, once the ballot is returned by the voter, process it again, go back and confirm eligibility, and then go work through um, the centralized tabulation of, of this huge spike in absentee voting. And in, in reality, what this means is that our election officials are now having to conduct two different elections. Um, the majority of election officials um, have, have uh, are in jurisdictions and in states where the electorate has relied primarily on in-person voting options. And the reality is the, um, the electorate is changing how it wants to vote. Um, so this means that they have to continue to offer safe and healthy in-person voting locations, right? And at the same time, conduct this separate vote by mail election. So it's, um, it's a logistical challenge and it's a big financial challenge. Great, great, thank you. And uh, you know, I'll just remind everyone that the responsibility for running elections in the United States rests with the states, and the federal government, you know, essentially has uh, very little to do with the operational choices that each state makes. Um, and as Liz said, there's uh, the likelihood of an unprecedented increase in the number of people who who will be voting by mail. For instance, California is now mailing. Uh, a, an application to everyone in the state. So, you know, the, it's expected that there'll probably be a, you know, 40, 50% increase nationwide in the use of vote by mail. 
Um, so it's going to be, as Liz said, really essential that election officials have the resources uh, necessary in order to process the inflow of those ballots. Um, and uh, that's why they need uh, mail sorting equipment, they need more poll workers, and they really need to upgrade their capacity in order to handle this, uh, this new situation. Um, so we'll get back to Liz, I'm sure, a little later, but uh, Liz, thank you. And let me turn uh, now to Kelly Vlakis hanks CEO of ECOS. And Kelly <clears throat> is in California and has been thinking, I know a lot about voting and democracy and has been an active supporter of uh, Business for America's work. So Kelly, I'll turn it over to you to hear you know, why this is an important issue to you and your company. Absolutely, thank you, Richard, for having me here today. Thank you, Sarah, as well. Uh, we're really proud to partner with Business for America on this very important issue. Uh, as Richard pointed out earlier, uh, we manufacture plant-powered cleaning products, the Ecos brand. I have manufacturing facilities in four states, in Illinois, in New Jersey, in California, and in Washington. And we've been working very closely in all of those states to ensure safe and secure voting. Uh, for us, our company is founded on the mission of protecting people and the planet, and also the mission to create more access for people to healthy homes. And we also feel very passionately about access to a healthy democracy. And there's no doubt that voting is key. It's the key hallmark to a healthy democracy. Uh, at our company, for many years, we give our team members time off to vote. So every single year on voting day, uh, we convene, we release all of our factories early, and we wanna make sure that people have the time to really vote for the world that they want to live in creating a future for our families, for our children, and, and really being able to make a decision at the polls. And so this issue, uh, especially this year during COVID, is extremely important to us. We're obviously an essential business. Uh, cleaning products are the number one weapon in the war on COVID. So we've been open throughout this entire time, manufacturing in all four of our facilities. We see firsthand the amount of money time and resources it takes to protect each and every one of our team members to keep everyone safe. It's very challenging. And this is an environment in which we control everything. And so when you talk about having elections and you talk about keeping the workers safe and the voters safe, it is very expensive, very costly, and very important, it must be done. And so that's why I've been very passionate about calling on Congress to ensure that we provide the proper funding to secure safe and secure elections. I've had, unfortunately, five months of experience on what it takes, and I'm just talking about protecting 400 team members. And in this case, we're talking about a nation. And so anything that we can do as a business to lend our voice, our experience, our influence. We want to make sure to do it because in the end of the day, it's the only way to truly ensure a healthy world for everyone. Kelly, thank you. Let me ask you, um, you know, when you think about the corporate culture of your firm, as well as the other companies on this call, um, you know, supporting a healthy democracy isn't necessarily what you get up thinking about every morning you know, the first thing I, I would imagine. But it's obviously become more top of mind and more important for you, I know, over the past few years. So how has it come to be briefly that, you know, this issue of a healthy democracy, broad scale participation in the electoral process, making sure your employees can vote, how has that come to be, if you could describe that? Sure. Well, I think, you know, civic leadership is just as important in terms of corporate responsibility and the things that we really need to focus on. So you're right, Richard. I get up every day thinking about how to have a healthier planet and healthier people on this planet, how to make sure that we have ingredient transparency and that we have a lot of regulation around things that are very toxic to human health. And so I've spent a lot of time meetings with members of Congress. I've traveled to the Capitol frequently, both here in all four of the states we reside in, 
plus uh, at the federal capital to lobby for things that are really important to us. And so, you know, our corporate culture has really been built around family. We're still family owned and operated after 53 years. Um, and as you know, Richard, we believe in paying a fair living wage, $17 an hour, uh, PPO insurance for everyone. And so really taking a look at our team as part of our larger family. And we need to take a look at our country the same way as American citizens. What can we do to protect one another? What can we do to stand together? What can we do to really lift up everyone? And that's the kind of company we've built and I continue to lead. And so really stepping into this arena is just furthering that goal. It's just one more level of how we can create a healthier planet and a healthier democracy is key. We need to make sure that we have leaders and decision makers that are reflective of the values that we hold dear. So I value, you know, the safety and the health of my family, my community, and I want to make sure to elect people that also have those values as well. Each and every one of our employees has the right to that. Each and every one of our consumers has the right to that. And each and every one of our citizens has the right to that. And so I'm really glad to see the businesses really getting together to kind of, you know, galvanize and put weight and strength behind the great importance of a healthy democracy. Great. great. Kelly, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so let, let's... Let's build on that because I imagine Kirby uh, from Sweet Green has some similar thoughts, but you know, in a, in a very different industry. So, um, Kirby, when you think about Sweet Green's you know culture and the mission, um, what has caused it to become involved um, in encouraging its workers and then by extension your customers to be thinking about voting? Um, you know, how how has that become so important to your firm? Thank you so much, Richard, and, and you know, really thank you to Richard and Sarah for having me. We're very proud to be a part of this uh, collaborative. Um, I do just want to start by saying that you know, Sweetgreen is a mission and values-driven company, and you know, we serve fresh salads, warm bowls, hot plates, and we use locally sourced ingredients from farmers that we have a direct relationship with. Um, just to give you a sense of our scope, we have over 100 restaurants and operate across um, 10 states. And you know, for us, it really starts with our mission, which is to build healthier communities. And so you know, we believe in empowering everyone, uh, first and foremost, our team members, our employees, uh, to have a say in the, you know, the world around them, the local and federal policies that impact each and every single one of us every day. Um, you know, so for us, you know, personally, many issues that we care about are at stake this fall, including policies impacting the environment, food insecurity, and how we educate and feed our next generation in schools. So we believe that we have a responsibility as a company to support our employees in, in exercising their, their right to vote. Great. And so the, the work that um, <clears throat> Sweet Green is, is, is doing, you know, do, you, do you have a specific program, Kirby, whereby you know, you're giving people time off or you're advocating? I, you know, I know that that our organization and your company have just begun working together, but I know you've been thinking about these issues prior to talking to us. So tell us a little bit about some of the inside details that are, you know, are happening within Sweet Green. Yes, yeah, so we'll be offering up to three hours of paid time off for our employees uh, so that they don't have to choose between work and making their voices heard. Uh, you know, we've also created custom uh, voter registration portal um, and back of house QR codes with when we all vote for our team members so that it's very easy for them to register. And we're also encouraging them to vote early in absentee or by mail to limit their exposure and help them reduce the spread of the virus. I think, you know, as we talk about voting, um, voting safely and we think about the pandemic, you know, just as at Sweetgreen, we've implemented best in class uh, safety standards to protect our team and our customers every single day. We urge Congress to do the same, to provide resources for states and local governments to, you know, do the same for general, the general public at the upcoming elections. Mm -hmm. And then the, you know, as the, as the murder of George Floyd uh, woke a lot of people up to think about the connection between racial justice, social justice, and participation in our political system. I know that Sweet Green's also been thinking about the, you know, those connections and how to engage your employees, but also then how to work within the communities you operate in to try to, you know, make these uh, connections about systemic 
systemic challenges that we face in our society, um, particularly around who isn't voting and what can we do to encourage more people to participate. So any thoughts on that you'd like to offer? Absolutely. You know, as we think about where our country is today, it's important to call out that COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic has only exacerbated the inequities faced by communities of color across the board, and that trickles down to the ability to cast their ballot. And so as we think about racial and social justice issues as a company, we know that we're in a unique position to help build a more just food system, and we're committed to using our platform to create sustainable change and racial equity in the world around us. Uh, you know, we, we believe firmly that one of the most important things that anyone can do to impact change is to vote. And so, you know, we believe it's our responsibility as a business to engage on this issue. And it's why we're speaking up in support of expanded mail-in voting options and safe, safer in-person polling places so that every single citizen has an equal opportunity to shape the future of our country. Um, you know, one, one thing that, you know, we've been talking about is just how complicated uh, voting can be. Uh, so an, another thing that we are doing as a company is partnering with the ACLU and League of Women Voters to provide our team with comprehensive voter education, uh, resources on the voting process, um, informing them of important deadlines and key issues on the ballot. Because um, we do believe that no one should have to choose between the between exercising their democratic right and their health. Right. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And that, that last point about informing uh, employees and customers about the ways in which they will be voting this year is really critical and there's a huge role I think the private sector can play because in many states the rules have in fact changed because of COVID. Traditional polling places will be closed, um, more people as we mentioned will be voting by mail and business can be a real important educator uh, to employees and to the public uh, at large about that. Um, and then Kirby also just wanted to quickly, just one last thought was, you know, given that you have a presence in 10 states and, you know, have 100 or so restaurants, um, have you been thinking about how you might help to support election officials in, you know, in any of those jurisdictions, um, secure any of the supplies, resources that they need in order to run you know, safe and secure and credible elections? Yes, absolutely. You know, during the midterms in 2018, um, you know, what we have the most of is, is food, right? And so right. Right. In, in 2018, we um, did something called Bowls to the Polls, where we provided um, meals to those that were, were standing in line. And, you know, we're certainly exploring um, additional initiatives like that. Great, great. And that does sound healthier than Pizza to the Polls, which I know is another initiative. So uh, good. All right. Thank you. And that, that will be good for the vegetarians. Excellent. Good, Kirby, thank you. Let me turn to uh, Jonathan Perry uh, with Lime. Jonathan is the head of government relations. And Jonathan, I know you folks have been thinking a lot about um, the connection between mobility and people's ability to get to the polls, particularly given the, some of the stress that public transportation systems are facing. And given that you have a service that allows people to get around uh, and that you have a culture that encourages people to participate. You know, I, I wonder if you could tell us about some of the activities at Lyme and, and also what's inspiring those activities. Yeah, sure, absolutely. Um, quick correction, I'm the Director of Advocacy, not Head of Government Relations, but I just okay. wanna Sorry. make sure Sorry that's that. out there. Totally fine. Um, yeah. But, uh, you know, thank you, Richard. Thank you, Sarah, um, so much for, um, organizing this effort for giving Lime the opportunity to stand with um, all of these these great companies using their platforms um, in calling on Congress to ensure voters can make their voices heard this election without risking their health and safety. Um, so, you know, quick background in 2018, um, and we're a relatively new company launched in, in 2017. So in 2018, Lime offered free rides to the polls on election day to help with breaking down barriers to transportation. Uh, we also made sure that our employees had the time that they needed to, to cast their own votes. Uh, but this year, you know, given how pivotal this election is, given the challenges that we're seeing people face um, all across the country, uh, we really wanted to do more. And you know, we know that COVID-19 is likely to impact voter turnout and that there have been recent measures to uh, weaken voting rights that have had impacts during the primaries as well. Um, so actually this week we announced our 2020 get out the vote effort, which we're calling roll call. 
and it comprises a number of partnerships, resources, and initiatives that we'll engage in leading right up to um, November. Uh, on voter registration, we've partnered with When We All Vote, which is a nonpartisan voter registration organization, and we're um, teaming up with them to make it easy for our riders to register and find voting resources right within the Lime app. Um, we're excited to join two additional efforts, Vote Early Day and Power the Polls, to help our riders and employees better understand their options for voting early and voting by mail, um, as well as learning how to volunteer as a poll worker, which we expect to see um, a shortage of poll worker volunteers this year. Um, and ultimately, this comes back down to Lyme's mission, you know, where our mission is really to foster what, what we think of as people first cities and empower the residents to have um, affordable, reliable, and sustainable transportation options. Um, you know, we're a business that's really you know, we've seen the impact that COVID has had on public transportation um, very clearly, uh, and, and our own business has paused operations in uh, nearly every city earlier this year to adapt and learn. Um, as uh, people start riding again, we're seeing um, some changes in uh, how riders and cities are using micromobility. Um, they're using it more frequently. They're changing how long they ride. Uh, we're seeing, you know, rather than only being this first and last mile solution, um, but rides are now 34% longer. Um, they're going 18% farther. So people are actually using them to use their, their complete trips, which is great to see. Um, but you know, we, we know that there's no doubt those same concerns around using public transportation or ride sharing, waiting in long lines and you know, crowded rooms to cast a vote may deter people from voting on November 3rd. So um, you know, we're, we believe that states and cities must have the resources to offer voters um, secure absentee ballots and in safe, safe uh, in-person voting sites for this election. And you know, as Liz was saying, this, this really shouldn't be controversial. Um, absentee voting is already available in 34 states in the District of Columbia. Um, and I know there's a, a recent poll that um, showed 67% of voters now support mail-in ballots for this election. So um, these are all reasons why we're really, really proud to join Business for America and, um, and so many of these other uh, companies and organizations and breaking down these barriers. Thanks. And Jonathan, what has been the response thus far you know, to your, uh, from your customers across the country? Is this a message that's resonating in all states or are you finding it's you know, more, you know, more relevance in certain places than others? Well, we're just rolling it out really this week. So we're you know, um, starting to do some in-app messaging and seeing how uh, in select cities, riders are responding to the voter registration uh, piece. Uh, yeah, I, I can say that in 2018, uh, at that time, the promotion that we used for um, the free rides on election day was our, our most used um, promotion ever. Um, so we saw you know, one in 10 rides um, on that day uh, had used the Lime promotion. So it was, you know, we definitely saw riders utilizing the ability to take Lime to the polls. Mm -hmm. That's great. And then how are you um, educating uh, the riders about some of these com complexities about how to get registered? You know, do you, are you doing that in real time or are you doing that? Yeah. On, um, you know? Those pieces will be rolled out, but we've created a, a landing page, um, limetothepolls.com, and you can find a number of resources there, uh, registering to vote with, um, <clears throat> with When We All Vote. You can find the um, Vote Early Day and Power the Polls resources. We're also linking to a, a petition from the Brennan Center, so our riders can actually directly get involved in advocating to their representatives on this issue. Uh, and we're gonna continue to add resources there and. Um, find ways for our riders and our employees to, to be more educated on this. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Good, good. Thank you. And thanks for that good work. Um, we'll come back to that here, I think, in a, in a moment. Let me now turn to Jen Swain with Burton. Um, Jen, I know Burton has you know, a history of weighing in on lots of different policy issues. Um, so two things, you know, one, how has it been that a company that makes snowboards uh, has become and worked a lot on climate in particular and, and, you know, outdoor recreation and public lands, how has it become interested in and committed to this issue about voting and about a, a strong democracy? Um, and then the second part of that, you know, is 
how does that fit into your corporate culture um, of, you know, of, of wanting to educate your customers um, about that issue? Sure. Um, a little background on Burton uh, for context. So um, we are the brand that pioneered the sport of snowboarding um, nearly 40 or over 40 years ago. Um, we have a thousand staff around the world. 400 are based at our headquarters in Vermont and then another 600 throughout the U.S. at retail and other operations locations and around the world. Um, and Burton is proud to be a certified B Corporation, which means that our business practices are verified to be balancing profit with purpose. Um, for us, we really see that policy change is crucial to building an equitable and regenerative future for people in our planet. And these are values that Burton as a business and many in our broader community hold. However, um, we know that voter turnout in the US was one of the lowest in the developed world prior to COVID-19 and participation is particularly under threat this year. Um, in a recent Pew poll, two thirds of Americans expect that the presidential election will be disrupted by COVID-19. And the pandemic continues to disrupt primaries, to disenfranchise voters, and to damage trust in democracy. And we believe that no one should have to choose between risking their health and exercising their right to vote according to their own values. Um, so COVID-19, I think we're all aware, has impacted businesses in ways that we could not have imagined, particularly um, so in the retail sector. We're concerned that poorly administered or under-resourced elections will worsen the health crisis that we're already facing, which will compound the economic challenges throughout our country. And so as a business, um, much like some other panelists, um, Burton, Burton's employees and customers expect us to engage in a basic level of, of civic engagement. Um, and we offer our employees time off to vote in local, state, and federal elections. We support volunteerism at polling places, and we provide our broader community, so our customers and kind of the, the greater outdoor um, and snowboarding community with resources to promote voter turnout. So things like making sure that you are registered to vote, um, requesting a, a mail-in ballot that will actually be um, uh, the request form will be mailed to your house, so making it even easier to get one step closer um, to actually voting, um, as well as voter guidebooks so that people can check out resources from the ACLU and protect our winters and kind of um, figure out uh, their own way to educate themselves on the values that matter to them. And so we're really engaged as a business. We see that this is a, a crucial issue, um, and particularly this year. Um, we need to additionally take action to safeguard the democratic process. And so that's why Burton is urging all elected officials to provide the funding and the tools that are needed for our community to be active and engaged citizens. And that includes access to voting safely, both in person and by mail. Mm -hmm. Jen, thank you. And has this um, um, been a, a, an issue that's been brought up by employees? Have you been hearing from coworkers that they expect the company to provide this educational support to uh, take a stand on these issues? Yeah, so, I mean, going back to questions about general advocacy, I mean, Burton's been working on climate policy advocacy at a federal and state level very actively since 2013. Um, and we've kind of expanded the, the causes that um, we're working on and civic engagement is one um, that is, you know, of increasing importance during this time of crisis. Um, and so it's something that we're really making sure we get involved in. Um, but it's also nothing new for Burton. You know, we also during the midterm elections in 2018, um, through our retail stores and throughout our company, we're providing opportunities to check voter registration and um, really encouraging turnout. So, I mean, for us, we, we as a company have um, strong stances and strong values, and we don't impose those on our community, but we want to make sure that our whole community, whether that's the employees, the customers, or others, um, have the ability to exercise, um, you know, their own, their own rights um, and mm -hmm. raise their voice in the same way that Burton does as, as a business. Right, right. And then you know, what advice might you give to companies who haven't been involved in the public policy process uh, when they might approach, uh, you know, their elected official at the local or state or even federal level, you know, how in sort of concise 
um, description might you give some guidance to, you know, what, what is an effective way to make the business case on this issue about uh, election security and about voting? Sure, I guess there's a, a bit of two parts to that question. One is kind of getting involved in advocacy um, for the first time. So that can take many forms, um, right? You can sign on to a letter like with Business for America and Vote Safe 2020. Mm -hmm. um, you can additionally seek to have meetings with um, uh, representatives and their staff members. Um, the thing that we hear time after time in meetings in general um, with elected officials is that the voice of the business community is incredibly important and it is not heard often enough and that the stories that businesses bring to the table um, are really impactful. And so I think the first part is just um, if, if you believe in a strong democracy, then this is a time right now to speak up. Right. And, yes, right. Um, and it's a nonpartisan issue, really. Um, and then I guess, you know, the next point is, um, you know, it, it really varies by business, um, what sector you're in, what, what business model you operate under, but um, business is, is greater than uh, an individual company, right? So when, um, when I go to speak with, um, you know, a senator, I'm speaking um, on behalf of the outdoor industry, which is $887 billion in economic activity annually, which is much larger than pharmaceuticals, right? But we consider right. that pharmaceuticals are, are kind of the stronger lobbyists at the table often. Um, so I think just thinking of the power of the whole and, and you know, the 200 plus businesses that are coming together for this particular cause through Business um, for America I think um, it's that force that we need to show that across different sectors, um, across perceived values, this is an issue that unites us all um, and that business is both stepping up to the plate to take responsibility in providing our employees time off to vote, supporting volunteerism at polling places, providing PPE. I won't get into that too deep, but there's tons of that mm -hmm. going on. So we right. need our elected officials to back us up with the funding um, necessary and um, to push forward policies that allow safer voting um, this year kind of in, in partnership. Right, great, good, thank you. Let me, let me switch back to Liz. And Liz, the, someone has asked a question about vote by mail in the context of the postal system. And so you all, you know, have, everyone's probably been uh, observing that there's a, a debate in Congress about whether the postal system will be refunded and it is operating in a deficit situation now and um, has been somewhat politicized certainly over the past year. So Liz, um, what insight can you give us about the future of the postal system? And um, do you think Congress will allocate sufficient dollars? And do you have some confidence that the postal system will be able to handle the uh, dramatic increase in, in uh, people voting by mail? So um, thank you for the question. Um, you know, no surprise to anyone here, the USPS is an integral um, partner of election officials across the country in ensuring that people can vote by mail and people that cannot or do not want to come to the polls in person can um, cast a ballot. And the health um, and the financial stability of the United States Postal Service is a, um, a big concern of election officials across the country. So there, um, uh, there has recently been a deal where um, Congress is going to loan money to the post office um, in the short term, which is a, a good thing. Um, that said, um, the huge spike in absentee voting that we are expected to see um, hit the USPS this year is, should be very manageable for um, USPS. Um, the surge that we are likely to see will be um, probably in line with what they would normally handle in the holiday season. Um, so the staff are, are ready, um, but I definitely want to acknowledge, you know, that there are hurdles. They've had some leadership changes, and I think a lot of election officials are kind of in a wait and see um, posture to see whether or not um, the, the program that the USPS has, which um, allows for regional 
coordinators to work directly with local election officials on things such as ensuring that election mail has the official indicia that it's election mail and ensuring that that gets delivered and has priority over other mail. Um, sure that the um, programs that the USPS has set up um, in partnership with election officials are working as planned, but um, definitely something to keep an eye on. Right, and it's certainly another opportunity, Liz, for companies to weigh in uh, in letting their members of Congress know how critical the postal system is, um, you know, not only to running the election, but also delivering medication um, and, you know, and other important, um, you know, supplies across the country. Um, so let me, let me turn back to, to Bonk for a moment to describe a little bit more about what we refer to as Operation Vote Safe. Um, and we sort of consider that an all hands on deck effort from, uh, from the private sector to help state and local election officials administer their elections in a safe and secure and credible way. So we have um, a number of efforts underway now in particular states. And uh, we've been hearing from lots of election officials about what they need. So Bonk, why don't you provide some more detail if you could and how those on the call can participate. Sure, um, you, so this is, um, oh, it's never really been done before to marshal the resources of the business community, mobilize conscious businesses to provide this sort of direct assistance to the election um, at scale. Uh, we know a lot of businesses have done that individually, but for us to have a coordinated effort is a kind of a bit of a new thing here. So um, we are focused on a small number of states to start. Uh, we're gonna see how far we can take this, um, but just to really quickly reflect on kind of what we're hearing as we're talking to state election officials, I won't mention the state, but we heard, uh, we were talking to a team um, in a certain department of state uh, and they said that um, they feel like they're uh, going through the sofa cushions for resources. So there really is an opportunity to, to have an impact here. You know, even if you, if you think your contribution is small, it makes a difference. So the way this works is we're building these relationships